That's not making YouTube, Connor. <laughs>
sitting on my bed in a towel all day, just slow cooking the motherfucker. <laughs> it's like making a ragu. So yeah, exciting to be back out on the stag and a lot of my best friends are on it. A lot of, basically it's a lot of comedians that I started out with in comedy. A lot of my favorite comedians are on the stag. Not my favorite comedian. My favorite comedian is my gran. Um, she's not actually on the circuit, she's 94, but she's a Scottish granny. And to me, all Scottish grannies by default are comedians and philosophers. You'd love her. She's like Plato and Peter Kay, my gran. <laughs> she's class. She always knows the right thing to say. She's got all these great old wise granny sayings that I always cling to and always phone her up in times of hardship. I do think it's a great shame that she was born a girl in poverty in 1920s because she'd have been a great comedian. She really would. All her material would be about Sudoku and how she can't stand up, but the way she'd tell them. <laughs> Alas, she wasn't on the stag, though, because she's not mates with Chris. <laughs> These are the characters. Chris, he's the stag. Um, Martin, lovely guy. John, lovely guy. Graham, nice but boring. I've tried to cut him out of the show as much as I can. Uh, it doesn't... That's part of my remit tonight. It doesn't interest you one bit as an audience to hear about Graham tonight. That's, I've tried to edit it that way. He'll crop up a couple of times. Just try and ignore him when he does. <laughs> Nice, very boring man, though. John, he's one of my best mates, and that's who I'm rooming with on the stag. We're sharing an Airbnb together. Ideal. I love an Airbnb. I know it's unfashionable, but I fucking love an Airbnb. It's so much better than a hotel, because you get to look through all the host shit. <laughs> it's good. They fuck off, but they leave their stuff, and you just get rifled through it. So I basically treat the first night in an Airbnb like the first 10 minutes of an escape room. <laughs> just, just gathering clues, you know? What kind of person is this? Original artwork, but Sports Direct mugs, they're a fucking enigma. <laughs> so me and John are rooming together. And he's a lovely guy, John, as I say. He's the kind of guy, like, if you met him, you'd be like, I've not got a bad word to say about that guy. But I've known him for too long, so I do. Uh, I'm going to tell you it today. He's got one toxic trait, my friend John. I don't know how this is going to play in this room. There might be some of these people in tonight. I don't know. We'll just see how we go. His toxic trait is he's a long voice note sender. All right, there's a few snakes in the grass tonight. I, I can sense it. Some people elbowing their mates and shit. There's a few long voice note people in. Frankly, you're not welcome. Uh, <laughs> I think it's the height of arrogance, the long voice note. I really do. This fucking... He, John will do five, 10, 15 minutes sometimes. This fucking one-sided conversation I'm not allowed to be a part of. <laughs> I've got to stop my day to listen to this fucking hostage podcast. <laughs> and you need to listen, because he's threaded questions all the way through, you know? It's, it's like a French listening exam. <laughs> I'm an old-fashioned guy. I think if you want a monologue for 15, 20 minutes, you know, get to the comedy clubs, work it up. <laughs> Hone your act, you know? John's a good comedian. If you go see him, well-written, elaborate, it's great. His voice notes have none of that. They are rambling, <laughs> self-indulgent hack shit. And I've got no time for it. I just hate it as a thing, a modern thing. Like, back in the day, we had voicemail. So much better, you know, you phone someone. If you didn't get through after, like, 30 seconds, well, firstly, you had to leave your name and your number, and then after, like, 30 seconds, they go, boop, 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 as if to say, get off the stage at the Oscars, you're waffling. <laughs> now, what's up? They've taken the cap off. John, as I say, 10, 15 minutes sometimes. Just no regard for the listener whatsoever. <laughs> Never stops his day. He'll be melting. He's always in Tesco, just milling about Tesco. <laughs> I can play bingo with the catchphrases that he comes out with. They're all the same. So, it's, hey, Stu, just checking in. He always starts with that. Better let you go. He always says that. He always says that about nine minutes from the end. <laughs> <laughs> Better let you go. And then he plays an encore Bruce Springsteen would be proud of. <laughs> just John, cutting about Tesco Express. Hey, Stu, just checking in. Making a bolognese tonight. <laughs> Thought I had all the bits, but... Didn't have garlic. Didn't have garlic. You're like, can you speed it up a touch? What, you, what is the message here? Back in the voicemail days, that conversation would go, hey, Stu, it's John, 0798350916. She left me and she took the kids. Call back. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. That's all I need. Give me the meat. Uh, you can relax, by the way. She didn't leave him or take the kids. That's just a little bit of fun at the end of a comedy routine. Uh, it's kind of a theme of the stag, to be honest. We're all of an age now. We're all in these kind of long-term relationships, settling down. I was the only non-homeowner on the stag, which I felt quite inferior about. I'm the only renter. Um, there was a period last year when me and my girlfriend were going to try and buy a place, but it didn't happen in the end. It was too expensive. And I say we, it was more her thing, to be honest. Like, she's a comedian as well, my girlfriend. But at the time, she had a more stable day job. And uh, we went together, me, her, and a mortgage advisor. We had this meeting, and the three of us mutually came to the decision together that the proposition of us buying a home was stronger without me. I don't really get it, something to do with my credit rating. I had it explained to me that in financial terms, I'm the equivalent of minus one people. 
It looked like I was trying to stop her from buying a house. That's what, it's like going on the chase and taking the minus off her. I'm that guy. I'd still go with her on the viewings, though. You know, I'm going to be a tenant. I've got a skin in the game. And there was always this awkward moment. We only viewed three places together, and it was always like a slightly older, nice kind of posh woman. She was like the estate agent. It always went the same way. There'd always be this moment when she'd sit us down, and she'd go, oh, this is nice, nice young couple. First foot on the ladder. I have to go, no, 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 it's, she's buying the house. Go, oh, God, are you not a couple? Nah, we are a couple. It's just I'm a financial burden. <laughs> Primarily. <laughs> and we viewed these three properties. I'm just going to give you the basic facts about these places, right? Basically, it's like good cop, bad cop when we view somewhere. She's good cop and I'm bad cop. She can only see positives and I can only see negatives, right? I didn't think this was acceptable, this final place that we viewed, right? I'm going to let you decide. You're all adults. You can make up your own minds. I'm pretty confident you're going to agree with me, though, right? That's my prediction. So first thing you need to know about the property that we viewed is it was, uh, it was a bed set. It's all in one room. So. <laughs> We're off to a flyer. You know on Homes Under the Hammer, where like, I'd love it to be small and shit. <laughs> they had like a toilet and a cupboard they were calling an ensuite, but it was all in one room. Great. That's the first thing you need to know. Second thing you need to know about this property is it was a shop. <laughs> Can you hear what I'm saying? Are you... You don't all live in shops, do you? It's not like the first time I've ever done this routine and I'm fucking it up. I'm saying the right word. You have to meet me halfway on this one. It was a shop. I can't help you out any harder than this. This is picture a shop, yeah? And then, well done, you've done it. It was, it was an old shop space. It was an old clockmaker's, which she thought was very charming, and I thought it was very not a flat. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> she thought that was fine. The Lettons agent thought it was class, because that's her job. I'm just getting gaslit two to one outnumbered. Like, I'm not the one that knows why I'm in a shop right now. What the fuck? It was a shop, I can't make it any clearer for you. You know when you're in WH Smith and you're like, yeah, I could live here. <laughs> make a little nest at the magazines, lovely. It was a shop. Like if we bought this place, I wouldn't be able to say, honey, I'm off to the shops. I'm at the fucking shops. It was on the main roads, get there, shop, 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 shop. Our flat. <laughs> we arrive, massive window. Massive. You don't realise how small the windows are on your house compared to shops <laughs> until you almost live in a shop. Let me t that is a stark moment of realisation, it really is. I've not been around all your places. I'm willing to bet your windows are smaller than, for example, TK Maxx. <laughs> it's a massive... Is this a sign? Lord knows what we're writing on that. This is not a shop. Keep out. <laughs> There's a massive window. We're on a main road. I've only got one room to hide in. I'm in bed till 2pm. I'm just going to be on display all day long. <laughs> Like the red light district or Tracy Emin, whatever cultural reference point you want. You start off so idealistic, you say things like, I'd love it to be south facing and have a conservatory. End up saying things like, I'm not living in a fucking shop. <laughs> Never thought I'd ever have to say that out loud to another adult, but. Well, we're on it. I'd like some rooms. <laughs> I don't want to sound like the King of England, but growing up, we had some rooms in my house. <laughs> you know, kitchen, bathroom, all the classics. That's what you want. You might be walking around going, we could raise a family here. I was saying things like, we could raise a family here. Be a fucking weird family. <laughs> Stay away from that family that lives in that shop. <laughs> also, imagine being out shopping on a Sunday, seeing me in bed going, what, what do they sell in there? Just some guy shouting about how he's not a nurse. <laughs> Good catchment area, though, to be fair. If you wanted the kids to go to school at home bargains. Ideal. <laughs> <laughs> it was tiny. As I say, it was one room, it was tiny. And it was unfurnished as well, that was a problem. So it was only going to get smaller once we put all our stuff in there. And, uh, basically, the only thing they had was a toilet brush. <laughs> well, not exactly first name on the team sheet, is it? <laughs> While I'm on it, I can't believe, as a society, we've never improved on the toilet brush. <laughs> as for that job. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'll ruin the show to make this point. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I can't believe we're not just all talking about this the whole time. There must be a better way than the toilet brush. Now, it's 2023. Fuck me. Let's knock some heads together. Come on. We put Man on the Moon, what, 70 years ago? We've got AI, VR, the metaverse. <laughs> and yet... <laughs> four inches from everyone in this room's toilet. It's a shit-covered brush on the end of a stick. <laughs> what are we doing? It looks like something you see on a school trip in a museum about the Romans or something. 
You're like, miss, what's that? Oh, it's, um... It's a shitty brush. The, uh... The Romans used to use it. They called it the toilet brush. They used to clean the toilet bowl with it. And how did they clean the brush? No more questions from you. <laughs> they just tried not to think about it. <laughs> so that was that. Dreams of owning a home dashed on the rocks. But, you know, what's for you, no go by you. As my granny would say, all in good time. Only rent are on the stag. First protocol on the stag is we go for lunch. We go for an Italian meal. And at lunch, I have a conversation that changes my life. I know that sounds grandiose, but it's true. Uh, but it's true. <laughs> it's a true. Uh, <laughs> good luck making that look slick in the edit, Connor. <laughs> I know it sounds grandiose, but it is true. And uh, it's a silly thing when we get there. But um, first, there's always an awkward moment for me now when I go out for a meal. Uh, basically, at the start of every meal now, no matter what, whenever the waiter or waitress comes over and they ask if there's any allergies, I need to go, yeah, I think I'm allergic to oats. <laughs> and yeah, everyone looks at me like you're looking at me now, <laughs> like, like I'm the biggest wank on the planet. I don't feel proud saying it. I mean, firstly, Italian cuisine, not exactly legendary for its use of oats. <laughs> Uno porridge, calzone, please. <laughs> Senor. Secondly, I think I'm allergic. I've not had it looked into. I know that's annoying. In my defense, I'd argue it's more annoying in the midst of a global pandemic to be like, I know 10,000 people died yesterday, but every time I have a flapjack, <laughs> my tummy feels icky. <laughs> Just suddenly overnight, one morning I'm eating porridge every day, every morning, like my ancestors have done for millennia. And then bam, just out of the blue, I become allergic. I feel sick every time I eat oats now. I feel really cut off from my lineage, you know? My gran has porridge every morning. She has salt on her porridge, my gran. Does that not blow your mind? I know it's traditional, but what are we doing, man? That's good old school Scottish philosophy. The day can only get better, you know? So we're at lunch, and basically, I, I realize I've got a bad relationship with food. My friend Martin, he asks us a hypothetical question, right? He asks us, if you had to give up one of food or sex, what would you give up and what would you keep? I know it's not a hot take, but for me, food and sex, both class. <laughs> Two of the greats, no notes, honestly. I'd be doing them both right now if I could. <laughs> and it'd be a hell of a show. I didn't have an answer, as I say. I should also say for context, this is just after lockdown. I'd let myself go during lockdown the way a lot of us had. I'd put on three and a half stone in the first lockdown. And uh, I didn't have an answer, as I say. My friend Graham, boring Graham, fuck Graham. Listen to this, right? You'll hate this. <laughs> Not even a preference. Graham tells us he doesn't like food. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? I thought we all agreed, no? Food's one of the only good things about life, no? I didn't put on three and a half stone in the first lockdown from all the shagging I was doing. <laughs> What are you talking about? He drinks that heel shit. He should be in prison. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have an answer, as I say, until a couple of weeks after we have this chat, me and my girlfriend, back in Glasgow, we order a Chinese. And while it's out for delivery, we have sex. And I'm not proud of what I'm about to say to you. But if I'm being honest, I thought about the Chinese the whole time. <laughs> Relax. There, there's your answer, though. If you've come thinking about your chicken balls and rice, there's your answer. Absolute no-brainer. I've never been eating a Chinese and thought about sex. I've been perfectly happy. So I realised that I've got a bad relationship with food. I come for eat, all this carry on. And I decided to change it. I, I need to do something. And I had to do something. Because at this point in lockdown, the sum total of all my efforts, exercise-wise, was completing half of one Joe Wicks workout uh, <laughs> designed for eight-year-olds, which... I'm not proud of, I probably could have done a full one, but he just fucking pisses me off so much. Like, I had to close the laptop. I hate that guy. I know everyone loves him, he's like a national treasure. I'm sure he's a lovely guy, he's done a lot of good, but he's annoying and we don't talk about it enough as a society. <laughs> I'm using my platform for good tonight. He's getting both barrels, this guy. I hate Joe X, he's just annoying. If you don't know who he is, there might be some international people, you might not know Joe X. He's like a Cockney geezer, and he's like a wildly popular food fitness vlogger, influencer, he's big on social media. Uh, during lockdown, he was obsessed with getting kids hench. Is that not highly suspicious to anyone else? <laughs> Why is this adult man trying to get a bunch of eight-year-olds into prison shape, like some Joseph Coney child army situation going on? Also, I know you're not meant to say this anymore, but he's thick, man. He's, <laughs> he's old school thick. He calls broccoli little trees. You're like 40. <laughs> I'm sure he's a lovely guy. He's done a lot of good, but I just hate the way he talks, right? If, you, if you're not aware, he's got three words he uses on a loop, right, instead of having a personality, right? 
If you don't know them, the words are bosh, no tea, cheeky, yeah. <laughs> bosh, no tea, cheeky, shop you cunt. I was uh, talk like an adult. I was watching him one night on Instagram, right? Instagram Live, he's making some whole wheat pasta monstrosity, right? <laughs> And it gets to the end, right? And there's a verbatim quote, right? He makes his shitty whole wheat pasta. And it gets to the end, and he looks at the pasta, and he goes, if you want to make your pasta a bit naughty, yeah? <laughs> Throw a cheeky handful of almonds. <laughs> almonds. What's naughty about that? Do you know what's naughty? Eating a vionette in your bed in your hands like a burrito. <laughs> That's what I've been doing. <laughs> Didn't put on three and a half stone eating almonds, you prick. <laughs> so I decide to get my act together. I'm going to say a wildly unpopular sentence to you now. I don't expect you to like this, but I'll win you back. It's all good. Um, a few months ago, I started seeing a personal trainer. <laughs> That's exactly what I've come to expect from a Scottish audience. Good on you. I love Scotland. I love, you know, I love... I've done this all over Britain, this joke, and British people hate this routine. It really makes me laugh. We're so miserable as a nation, it's unreal. I need some Americans in, some fucking positive people, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I honestly think it's the one thing that unites people from all corners of the British Isles is coming together to unite, to despise anyone else who's trying to improve themselves. <laughs> we fucking hate that. Stay shit like us! <laughs> need some Americans, man, some positive people. Like, my favorite TV show is American. I love the show Queer Eye on Netflix. Yeah, it's a great program. If you've not seen it, the concept is these five gay guys come and live with you for a week, and they sort of do your hair and your clothes up in your house, and they give you loads of confidence, and it's about self-acceptance and self-love, and it's a beautiful show. I don't think a British version would work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think... I think a British version of Queer Eye would be five straight guys with no taste fucking people's lives up <laughs> for a laugh. <laughs> taking really beautiful, confident people, give them a bus cut, take them to Primark, cut them down a peg or two. <laughs> Fuck, do you think you are? So I've been seeing this personal trainer for a few months, and you know, it's going well, I'm enjoying it, but to give you some context, for my whole adult life, I've always wanted, I've never been able to afford it, uh, now I can afford one of them. Ba basically, I've always wanted to get either a therapist or a personal trainer, and I've never been able to afford it, now I can afford one, and I've gone with a personal trainer, because I know it's not cool to admit, but I'd rather be depressed with abs. That's the, <laughs> that's the choice. How can you be depressed with a six pack? I don't know, I've not got one yet, I'm sure I'll find a way. But it's decadent, and I'm quite tight with money, you know, there's a cost of living crisis. It's not like I've come into money, I'm not rich or anything, but I've, I've basically just given up all hope of owning a home. <laughs> that was a pipe dream. That was never happening. They're so expensive, I don't know if you've heard, but they're a fucking rip houses. <laughs> all the money I was saving for a flat, I'm just funneling into my body now. Fuck it, I don't care. I couldn't give a shit about owning a flat anymore, I swear to God. I want to die 95 years old in a student flat share, shredded. <laughs> Ready to fight the Reaper. <laughs> Spark the cunt. None of this Captain Tom walking about shit. <laughs> I'm going out benching 300. <laughs> I had them recommended to me as well on the stag. My friend Martin recommended me as PT and my friend John recommended me as therapist. But again, the PT won because Martin is stronger physically than John is mentally. As, uh, <laughs> Martin can bench press his body weight. John cries at Emmerdale. I'll see you in the gym. <laughs> So I've been going, you know, and I've been enjoying it. But as I say, I'm quite tight with money. So to try and claw back the cost, what I do is I see my personal trainer twice a week. But while I'm there, I try and sort of steal therapy <laughs> from him. You know, I'm just doing bicep curls. Like, my dad never says he loves me, is that? <laughs> is that something you could shed any light on, Stephen? <laughs> doing squats, like, I just don't really know who I am. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm nearly 30 now. I thought I'd have it figured out, but I'm basically none the wiser, you know? I know, like, basic facts about myself, like I like the Arctic Monkeys and Chinese food, but it's, <laughs> it's not a personality, is it? I'm basically no better than Joe Wicks, and I'll stop to think about it. I mean, sometimes I think I know who I am, but I really don't. Like, I, I bought a new phone the other week, because I always want the best camera. They always sell me the best camera. Like, I need the best camera. And then after, like, a week of taking photos and looking through my camera roll, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not the kind of guy that takes stunning photographs. <laughs> I'm the kind of guy that takes a photo when it gets a bit crisp. <laughs> that's just who I am. Christ, that's bleak, Steve. Steve? <laughs> Trainer's like, I literally can't hear you. We are blasting Avicii in this gym. <laughs> so I've been going, you know, but it's a work in progress. I don't need to think I've got my shit together. I really don't. And also, I don't want my shit too... You ever see someone who shits two together? It's weird. It's creepy. <laughs> like Graham, boring Graham. It's two together. He stopped all the fun stuff, drink drugs, fags. All he does now is every week he goes up a hill. 
Like, go occasionally, but every week, what are you running from? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? What have you done in the city that means you need to be that far away? <laughs> also, he's got a new girlfriend. They're very sweet together. They, match, they both love hill walking. They matched on Tinder because they both had a, a mountain behind them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's nice. Crazy thing to me is, though, their first date was on a hill. Is that no fucking bananas to you? Like, I think eating is a bit much on a first date. They went hill walking. How long does that take? What, six hours? Especially if you're the girl, who's accepting that? Have you not heard of men? <laughs> men kill women on hills, what are you playing at? Even him, like, you know in the first 10 minutes on a date, if there's a spark, what if you're four hours into the ascent, she tells you she loves Mumford and Sons, what then? <laughs> Got to feign an injury and call Mountain Rescue. So my shit's not together. I still drink, that ruins my life all the time. But I love it, I can't stop it, it's so good. I've not, <laughs> not even got a joke for that, it's just a recommendation. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I still drink and I just, it just, it means I'm living a real Jekyll and Hyde lifestyle at the minute, where during the day I might make quite healthy decisions and I'm pretty sensible and then at night I'll go out and get smashed, make terrible life choices. And I can't quite square the circle these two beasts within me competing for air. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, one healthy choice I've made during the day, one change I've made. This is embarrassing to admit to a room full of strangers, but uh, my trainer's got me off milk. <laughs> Stop drinking. And not like I was a big baby, neck and loads of milk. But like, <laughs> instead of having a latte, I'll have a, a black coffee, you know, to save, what, 100 calories. I know it's pathetic, but I still drink, so it makes no sense. <laughs> I went out last week to a cafe during the day. I had three black coffees to save, what, 200 calories? I went out later that night, I had six pints of Guinness and nine white Russians. <laughs> like, who am I? Am I that guy or that guy? I started scraping mayonnaise off a sandwich into the bin, you ended up scraping chips out the pavement into my mouth. <laughs> I hate myself so much. After lunch, we take a walk into Newcastle City Centre. Being a lame stag, we've got loads of activities planned. We're gonna go to an escape room, it's the first one. Before we get there, though, we kind of feel like we stick out quite a lot in Newcastle. I don't know if you've been, but they take fashion really seriously. I think it's that Geordie Shore thing. They're all very preened and they all look beautiful. And we're a bit of a ragtag bunch. And I don't know, we just felt like we stuck out. Like, there's nothing wrong with looking fashionable, but I think there's a line. There's no easy way to get into this joke, right? I just, I'm just going to come out with it and you better go with me. We'll see what happens. Well-dressed babies really creep me out. <laughs> You know when you see a three-year-old who looks like he's been on Queer Eye? What the fuck? <laughs> you can look nice. Let them look like shit. They're like 80% yogurt. Let them look like shit. <laughs> I was watching Wimbledon in the summer. The little prince freaks there in the crowd watching. What's his name? George? <laughs> you know, William Kate, George, the wee freak. He's watching. His... <laughs> Cunts what? Sex? He's got a three-piece suit on. Fuck you, man. We get it. You're better than me. <laughs> We're in the town in Newcastle and there's a guy. I don't know, in his mid-30s or something. He's got like a Fred Perry shirt on. Basically, I should say, my big pet peeve is, like, if you're gonna dress nice, that's fine, but at least dress the kid different. Have you seen adults now, they dress the kids to look like them? <laughs> Have you seen that? That gives me the heaps, man. I hate seeing that. That's what this guy did. He was wearing a Fred Perry shirt, Timberland boots. He's holding his son's hand. His son was like three. I looked down. The kid is also wearing a Fred Perry shirt, <laughs> Timberland boots. It's like, yeah, he looks kind of cute. He does. He looks kind of cute. He also kind of looks like he's been doing coke all day at the slug and lettuce. <laughs> It's fucking weird. <laughs> Looks like a racist three-year-old. Well done. <laughs> so we arrive at the escape room. I quite like an escape room. Uh, I don't want to brag, but it's a bit of a busman's holiday because I've actually worked at two different escape rooms. Uh, I used to work at a Harry Potter-themed escape room in Edinburgh. Themed, it wasn't official. We had to make that very clear. <laughs> we had to call Voldemort he who must not be named for copyright reasons. <laughs> At that place, my job was I need to explain the rules of the game to them and the health and safety and everything. And then I would put a cloak on and I would give them cl like clues, hints and stuff like that, right? Very demeaning when I think back to it now, but <laughs> the best joke I've ever had in my life uh, sadly hasn't come from my stage career. It came from that day job. It's what we comedians call a banker. That's a joke that never fails. There are none in this show. Anything can fail at any moment. <laughs> The only bang I've ever had was at the Harry Potter place, right? I'm going to tell you it now. It might not crush as hard as it used to, because the context is very different. But believe me, this is a fucking killer joke, right? This would work 100% of the time, right? You're lucky to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> what I'd do is I'd give them the health and safety information about the game, and then I would say, this is the last you'll see of me, but I'll hopefully see you at the end if you make it out successfully. I'm now going to pass you over to our wizard clerk, and he's going to come out and talk you through the rules of the game, right? And then what I would do, this is very clever, <laughs> I'd hide behind a wall for about 15 seconds, put a cloak on, 
Some of you are ahead of me. <laughs> Some of the smarter kids in the class. I'd put my cloak on, I'd walk back out, I'd go, all right, how's it going? I'm the wizard clerk. People would lose their fucking minds. <laughs> I'd kill for a job like that in this show. Mums, stag dudes, doesn't matter. Stand innovation every time. They were standing anyway, but I could tell, you know, that it crushed. The other escape room I worked at, just to tie up that loose thread, I wasn't a wizard at that one. That was a, I used to have to pretend that I was fixing a spaceship in that one. I was a NASA engineer, so I didn't wear a cloak. I wore this boiler suit, which I stole. <laughs> we have a good time at the escape room. We then go axe throwing. That's another activity you can do these days. I don't know if you've done it. It's just what it sounds like. You've had 12 pints and a stag and they give you an axe. What can go wrong? <laughs> They market it like it's this great macho experience, like feel like a Canadian lumberjack. You kind of feel quite a lot like you're in a shopping centre in Newcastle. <laughs> Being supervised by a 17-year-old girl with blue hair who hates you. That's, <laughs> that's how it feels. And she teaches you how to throw the axe. There's three main ways. You'll know this if you've been. Uh, main ways, you can throw it over your head with two hands like that. Or you can throw it one-handed either side. You also, she taught us how to throw an axe underarm. Have you ever seen that? It's the cheekiest motion on earth. Like that. How fucking raging would you be if someone killed you like that? <laughs> I'm annoyed to die, but what a way to go. <laughs> so we have a good time there. And then we go uh, to a beer garden to watch the football, right? This is during the Euros, European Championships. England are playing, we're a bunch of Scottish lads, and we go on this big table outside in this beer garden, right? And this is where I have the second conversation that day that changes my life, right? Um, England are winning, it's the quarterfinals of the Euros, and um, my mate Chris, the stag, he's sitting behind me on this bench, and he misses England's last goal in this game, right? And as he does so, he taps me on the shoulder, and I turn around and I miss the goal too, right? And he says to me, he goes, Stu, have you got alopecia? <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> what? And then he takes a photo of the back of my head, and turns out I do, I had no idea. I've, I've got, got like a beer mat sized, like fucking bald patch in the back of my head, creeping up behind me like a coward. I had no idea. <laughs> it was such a weird, confusing moment, I had no idea. A couple of weeks later in Glasgow, I get it looked at by the GP. I do have alopecia, I've still got it now. At the time, I had one patch on the back. Right now, I've got a patch on the back that I'm covering with like root spray and hair fibers and stuff. But it's been a lot worse, basically. I, at its worst, I'd lost about 40% of the hair all over my head in different patches. Alopecia areata, it's called. Not quite as delicious as it sounds. <laughs> no one ordered that at lunch at the Italian. <laughs> at the time, though, before the diagnosis and the initial confusion, let's just take the baseline facts of this story. My mate Chris missed England's goal because I'm going bald. <laughs> as a man, as a Scottish man, probably the worst moment of my life, to be honest. England are winning and I'm going bald. When it rains, it pours. <laughs> Two weeks later, as I say, I go to get it checked by the GP and it's, it's an autoimmune disease. It's quite a mysterious thing. Not much is known about it. Your body kind of attacks itself and the hair follicles fall out. I didn't know anything at the time. I thought I was going to get it cured. I thought I'd get some like cream or pills or something like that. But I swear to God, I go to the GP, she takes one look at my head and she just goes, just wait and see what happens. <laughs> I was like, that's your, that's your professional... That's what I've been clapping for, is it? <laughs> that's what I've been out in the front lawn with a pan and a ladle for, is it? Just, just chance it, bro. I'm not slagging the NHS, but I love the NHS, but you can check this, I live in the heart of town. My GP currently boasts a 2.2 star rating on Google. <laughs> 2.2, 2, that's lower than any review I've had for my comedy, and I've had some shocking gigs. <laughs> Back at the time in the beer garden, bizarrely, if you want to bring the projector down, Sean, um, bizarrely, a photo was taken um, right, right when Chris first notices the ball patch. By the way, absolute piss take how slow this is. <laughs> I don't know about you, I don't know if you've ever tried to do stand-up comedy while that's happening. It's hard. <laughs> that's a mistake you only make once. So yeah, uh, right weirdly, when, when Chris tells me that he's noticed the ball patch, there's a picture taken. Uh, so you can kind of see this. I'm really sorry for you guys, you're not gonna be able to see this. If it makes you feel better, I came to see Richard Gadd here seven years ago, I paid 18 quid, I sat there. I've still not seen that show. <laughs> So yeah, this picture was taken at the time. That's Chris, the stag, there's lovely John, Martin. His name's Steve, I've cut him out of the show because he's got the same name as my trainer, that'd be confusing for you. Um, Graham's actually sat behind Steve, but he's too boring to be in shot. <laughs> you can kind of make out the ball patch here, it's not a great angle for it, but to be fair to Martin taking this, he didn't know this was gonna be used in a French show. Um, 
I'm, everyone else is ordering drinks off the QR codes. I'm just fucking staring at this picture at the back of my head. That's, <laughs> that's all I'm interested in. That's my whole life now. It's all I care about in the world. Terrible timing, the football's still on. About three minutes after this photo's taken, the camera pans to the audience. Who's there? Little Prince Freak, full head of hair, cunt. <laughs> I just start freaking out. It's so confusing for me. I, I, I don't know what to do. I just start furiously texting my girlfriend and my barber. It's <laughs> all I can think to do. Two most important people in my life, you know. Uh, my barber's a mate. He's a comedian as well, actually. I don't know why. Comedians just do everything for me. <laughs> At 2.2 stars, I wouldn't be surprised if my GP's on the open mic circuit. <laughs> I'm so confused trying to piece it together because it's so out of the blue. Like, for, for a second, I think maybe it was a prank on the stag. Like, someone shaved the back of my head, but we're a very lame stag. It can't be that. For about five minutes, I thought I might have just snicked it with the axe. I was... <laughs> I was going crazy, man. And uh, it brings me no real pleasure to show you the next picture, but just to give you an idea, about two weeks later, this is what my head looks like when I send it to the GP, right? And it gets worse than this, but basically, you know, these patches start arising all over my head, and... I'm making jokes about it now and everything, and I'm, I'm okay sharing it with you now, but I, you know, I still cover it, I'm self-conscious about it, and it was very confusing and disconcerting to go through at the time. It was, it was difficult to deal with, you know? They were going all over and joining in with each other, and you know, it really was, at the time, it was quite harrowing to deal with. Bloody big Chris Black. <laughs> you telling me you're not stopping to take a photo of that? You're lying to yourselves. All right, Sean, you can put that up now. Thank you, mate. Give it up for the projector, everybody. <laughs> Injury time. Uh, so, yeah, I'm in this pub beer garden. I'm furiously texting my girlfriend and my barber. That's all I can think to do. Uh, my barber, he just cut my hair the week before and he said he hadn't noticed it, so I knew it came on very suddenly. My girlfriend, she's no use. She's saying all the classics. She's like, well, I don't care if you go bald. I'll still love you. Yeah, I know that dipshit. <laughs> it's not you I'm worried about. <laughs> It's everyone else. So yeah, but no one looks at men's hair. No one looks at men's hairlines. I'm sorry, they do. <laughs> I'll tell you who looks at men's hairlines. Men like me that are going bald. That's all I see. I swear to God, there could be 5,000 women in here right now. I'm sorry, I don't see you. All I see is men's hairlines and where I plot on the graph. That's, that's all I'm interested in. Every movie I watch is about baldies versus the rest. <laughs> you don't realize how many villains are bald until you start going bald, it's a lot. Changes your whole worldview. Start watching Lord of the Rings from Gollum's perspective. <laughs> and as I say, it's been a lot worse than it is right now. So I feel lucky. But you know, it can come and go throughout your life. So I've just had to make peace with it. And I'll just shave it if it comes to it. It's all good and being bald. But it's annoying, you know. It's never the hair you want that falls out, is it? <laughs> it's never like we've got some good news and bad news, Mr. McPherson. You're going bald, bitch your ass. <laughs> Don't worry about it, brother. I feel like a lot of young men, when they start losing their hair, they console themselves with the thought of, like, at least I'll look hard. <laughs> All right, I can, <laughs> I can read a room pulling back Glasgow. You don't think I'm going to look hard? <laughs> I'm with you. I don't think I'll look hard. I feel like I could have a skinhead, a Mike Tyson face tattoo and nine scars, and I'd still look like my mum spoils me at Christmas. <laughs> and she does. It's just annoying covering it. I'm very self-conscious about the back of my head. I'm always kind of aware of where I am in a room. I always kind of want to have my back to the wall. Again, this job's perfect. I think worst job for me now would be orchestra conductor. That's not happening. <laughs> Certain considerations as well just have to be made. Like, I can't go swimming now because I, I cover it with fibres and root spray and they, they wash off. Also, I just don't want to put other people through that, especially young men. I can't have them watching me bomb in the pool with a full head of hair coming out bald going, Jesus, can it happen that quick? <laughs> All the girls just see a trailer burn, think I've shot in the pool. It's a lose-lose. Some people think it might be stress-related. I'm not sure about that, I don't know. I didn't really feel stressed at the time, but... Uh, you know what, it is stressful, having it, but... Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> I kind of hope that it is stress-related, because, don't get me wrong, I absolutely love doing shows. I love writing shows and performing them, it's great, but I find it so stressful, and it's so hard to have a good niche and selling point for your show, and I think that would be a good one. You know, if I was shedding hair during, you know, roll up, roll up, come see the comedian who decays live. <laughs> Bit of a Victorian freak show vibe. The timing of it was annoying, I have to say, because I know it's vain, but it was after the last lockdown. I'd lost the weight, I grew my hair out because the barbers were shut. I'd never had so many compliments in my life. That was my hot era, by the way, like two weeks at the end of lockdown. <laughs> So I started losing my hair. This girl said to me the best compliment I've ever heard, right? I didn't believe her, but I was so flattered, right? She said I looked like an Italian footballer. 
Well, it's, yeah, fucking hell. Men's faces are lighting up in the shadows. It's the best thing a man can look like. It's all any man ever wants to hear. Ladies, if you want to get a man into bed, just say he looks like an Italian footballer. <laughs> Jobs are good and you don't need to know any. Alla Pichariata, that's one. Uh, <laughs> AC Milan, right back, patchy player. She, <laughs> she said this to me and I was so flattered, but I didn't have the heart to tell her with the hair loss in about eight weeks, I might look like the worst thing a man can look like, a Scottish footballer. <laughs> 16 stone vaping in the center circle. <laughs> so it's a sort of weird, confusing time for me, this. And you know, I always think what would Grand do and phoning her up a lot at this time. She tells me things will lie be some ways, things have got to be one way, you've got to make peace with it, you know. I always think what would she do? I think she would shave it, you know, if it came to it. Weird thought experiment, but <laughs> she's not vain, you know, I think she'd shave it. Like, she's not vain, she's got a black tooth, my Gran. Because um, for years her dentist was an alcoholic <laughs> and he drilled a hole in her head. <laughs> and she still went back. She also told me once that her driving instructor was an alcoholic, which I love, man. I'm weirdly nostalgic for a time before my birth when you seemed to get any job you wanted if you'd had 10 cans and believed in yourself. <laughs> Is that not a more fair society? Sometimes it's harder than others to sort of ask what would Grand do? You know, a few months ago I had to ask myself the question, what would Grand do if her girlfriend of four years left her out of the blue for a more famous comedian? <laughs> you know, not easy. You know, because, well, Grand didn't have a girlfriend. <laughs> she had my granddad, and uh, he wasn't a comedian, he worked in an aluminium plant, so... <laughs> not an awful lot of crossover there. <laughs> I'm on your team, by the way. I wish she'd done it a few months earlier and then I could have just written her out the show, but she did it too close to the show having to be delivered, so I've got, just got a white knuckle it for the first half. <laughs> Hope that's okay. Wanted to come clean. Uh, you know, difficult. Um, you know, she left me for someone who, like, we'd paid to go and see together, someone whose podcast we used to listen to, someone whose merch she got. I've got a fucking T-shirt with this cunt's name in it. <laughs> it's like me leaving her for the strokes. He slid into her DMs, I could see it unraveling, and for the first time in four years, you know, I, I raised genuine matatas. <laughs> she tells me there's a kuna to worry about, but lo and behold, here we are. <laughs> nightmare that's another comedian as well. During the French, fuck me, there was just posters of the two of them everywhere, it was a nightmare. I could only be worse if she dumped me for the lady boys of Bangkok. <laughs> And I'm pretty chill about it, you know, it's all good. I've processed all this, don't worry about me, it's all good. But I'm chill about it, but I think you need to give yourself license to be angry sometimes. That's healthy, right? Like, you need to be angry sometimes. And I'd be lying to you if I said I never pictured the two of them together. And just, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just... <laughs> Satisfying. Um, you might be sitting there thinking, you know, is it not difficult to tell jokes like you're still in love with someone in the first person? Is that not difficult, given what happened? They're like, honestly, yeah, it is. But I've got a little technique I've developed where I tell you jokes about her, but in my mind, I've changed them all to be about Graham. <laughs> Finally, some intrigue in that character, you know? So, <laughs> me and Graham were gonna buy a shop together. <laughs> Graham said he'd still love me if I went bald. I'm fucking Graham thinking about the Chinese. <laughs> It's just a bit of fun. It's easier for daddy that way. And uh, never call myself daddy on stage before. It's a shame that that's also caught on film, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one more routine that she's in, right? And I wanted to keep the joke, but I just wanted to be honest with you. So is it okay if I keep the joke, but I just make it about Graham? Yeah. All right, good, thank you. I really want to keep my beard. I've got, basically I'm losing my hair, but I'm also, I've got a couple of tiny patches in my beard. I need the beard because I've got a massive head and a tiny mouth. And, <laughs> Without the beard to distract, there's just great swathes of inactivity <laughs> around the side of my face. It's like when you get a pizza and they put all the toppings right in the middle. It just, <laughs> just looks weird, man. I've had a beard for like 10 years, and like all men with beards, once a year I make the mistake of shaving. Oh yeah, I'm ugly. You always forget. <laughs> if a guy in your life has a beard and he shaves, check in, honestly, because <laughs> it's the sign of immense emotional turmoil. It really is. It's like when a woman gets a fringe. That's our version. <laughs> Also, I know this is disgusting, but I've got thick back hair. I'm really hairy, and last, it was disgusting anyway, but in the last few weeks, I've noticed patches of alopecia coming out my back, which I honestly think is the most rank thing on any human being <laughs> worldwide. I look like a fucking sick dog when I take my top off. <laughs> also, I've got like tiny legs. I've got like 28 inch legs. I'm like 90% back. 
And I'm worried if I lose my back hair, it's gonna be like when you shave your pubes to make your dick look bigger. It's just, <laughs> just my back, I don't need the help, you know? <laughs> the ratios are just all out. Tiny legs, massive back. In fact, the first time my friend Graham ever saw me naked, <laughs> he... <laughs> You'll love this, this is classic Graham. He said of my legs and back and the ratio, Graham, he said, naked, I look like, it's like, you know when you pick a cat up? <laughs> and its legs are still on the floor. It's just, all back, baby. Like a hairy slinky, that's me. And now Graham's left, I've got to trim my own back with my beard trimmer in the shower, but there's a bit in the middle I can't reach. I've basically got a fucking Hitler moustache between my shoulder blades. It's brutal. It's weird being single again, I've got to say. It's been a long time, seven years, because I had a girlfriend for four years, and then it was three years before, uh, and it was kind of back to back, and I didn't have any time off. So it's a long time, seven years. So much has changed, I can't remember what you're doing. I'm just like going around town asking pretty girls if they've had Gangnam style. <laughs> You seem really nice. You want to come back to mine, do the ice bucket challenge? Come on! <laughs> so it's seven in total, but me and my ex, that was four years. My longest relationship, quite a long time, you know. Full presidential term. <laughs> four years. I think I'm going to treat it the same way. You know when the electorate gets bored of one president, they vote in the polar opposite and then blame all the problems on the last lot. <laughs> I think I'm going to do that. And my ex was quite a wishy-washy liberal character, so I think for my next girlfriend, I'd like quite an extreme right-wing bigot. <laughs> Bit of a protest vote, you know. <laughs> Introduce her to all my lefty pals. So this is Chloe. I don't agree with everything she says. She's a threat to Western democracy, but she turns me on. <laughs> I'm still figuring out as well, talking about being single on stage and sex and stuff. I don't really like it. I like talking about being in a relationship, but... Oh, fuck you, Graham. You've driven me to this. I'm talking about shagging now. I, uh, I've got one observation from the field as a newly single man, and you'll understand why I'm telling you and why it's pertinent to my show, but for whatever reason I've learned recently, girls nowadays absolutely love to, for whatever reason, quite firmly pull the back of my hair. <laughs> Where I've been losing hair. <laughs> and I don't like it at all. <laughs> and they'll yank it, they'll see the fear mask. Do you not like it? No, it's literally the last thing on earth I want, actually. <laughs> It keeps me up at night, actually, the thought of what... I need to be so gentle in my hair, that's why I'm slow cooking it all day long. <laughs> Just yanking out willy-nilly, and then I need to come clean. I don't know if you've ever tried to explain an autoimmune disease whilst lovemaking before. It's <laughs> tricky, hard to keep it horny and informative. <laughs> Showing her links to the NHS 24 website and shit. Do you not like it? No. Well, I like it. Why don't you put my fucking back moustache and then we both win? <laughs> The fallout from this is, I didn't realise, but I was round at a girl's once and she rubbed it off. Like, I cover it, as I say, and she rubbed it off. And the next morning, I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror and I had this baldy patch. And I felt so self-conscious and vulnerable and exposed and I felt really shit about myself. And basically, what this means now is, <laughs> it's embarrassing, but I now need to bring a baseball cap with me to cover my head on a walk of shame. <laughs> so I need to carry a hat about, basically, whenever I think there's like a 1% chance I might get lucky. And obviously there's that ugly eagle male brain that's like, well, I'm a catch, I could easily fuck at this christening. <laughs> I'm trying not to fuck when I go to Londis, thank you. <laughs> so I'm just carting this hat about with me all day long, willy and nilly. I can't tell you how lonely a feeling it is coming home alone from a long evening in a nightclub and having to hang your shagging cap up on the back of the door. <laughs> not tonight, cowboy. Tonight we ride solo. <laughs> oh, I better let you go. <laughs> By which I mean there's about nine minutes left. I, uh, I don't want to get too sincere on Maine, but <laughs> it's such a thrill that you're all here. I'm so psyched that you all came out and sold out. It's amazing, so thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, it's very cool of you. Yeah, thank you for coming. Because you can't do it alone. That's something I've really learned in the last year. It's one of the good things, and there's not many about getting dumped, is your mates really rally around you. Your mates come out for you, you know? You know what it's like when your friend gets dumped? You sort of take them out in the town, you distract them. 
it's good, you know, you get to see all your friends you've not seen for a while. Like, so Gemma took me bowling, me and John went to the cinema. My sister took me to an escape room, actually, which was cool. A bit on the nose as a diversion tactic, if I'm being honest. <laughs> my sister literally took me into an establishment called Escape Reality. <laughs> wow. <laughs> when I was heartbroken in the escape room, it reminded me of a time that I was working at the Harry Potter place, and, uh, a group was late, right, and it was, it was booked for two people and it was under a woman's name, right, and it was about 10 minutes uh, after the time when they were meant to arrive and I was ready to cancel the game because that's what I meant to do. But a guy bulls in on his own, he's like out of breath, he's like, right, come on, let's do it. And what I meant to do is cancel the game. He's on his own and I should tell you what I didn't tell him and that is that the game is only playable for two to six people, right? <laughs> he's on his, he can't do it on his own, you can't do it, you can't complete the game, right? But clearly to my mind what's happened is his partner's booked it but outside, they've had a blazing row. She's left him. He's gone, fuck it, I'm taking the escape room. That's <laughs> all I've got. And he looks sad and he's out of breath and he comes in. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to do because, well, I need to cancel it and take the money. That's what I'm supposed to do. But also, I feel too sad for this guy. So the choice is either I cancel the game or for the next 60 minutes, <laughs> against the clock, I'm just this guy's girlfriend. <laughs> So I say, yeah, fuck it, let's do it, come on, man. So we go through, I sit him down, I give him the health and safety spiel, I say, this is the last you'll see of me, I'll hopefully see you at the end if you make it out successfully. But I'm gonna pass you over to the wizard clerk, he's gonna come through, <laughs> tell you the rules of the game. Okay, all right, how's it going, I'm the wizard clerk. That gets nothing. <laughs> that joke dies in its ass for the only time in its whole career. All right, let's have some fun. We go into the escape room, and I'm on his team now, but I work there, so it's, I feel it's weird, I'm snookered. I, feel, I kind of feel like a sex worker in this situation. Because I need to look really into it, but I know too much. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I know how the sausage is made. It's a weird setup. He knows nothing. I know everything. I don't know how much to help him. And we're not getting on well either. There's a bit at the start where he's like looking for a key in this box. And I'm like, maybe you should check under the table for the key. He's like, no, no, I'm just looking in this box. I'm like, bitch, I work here. <laughs> is this why she left? I feel like you never listened to me, Sean. <laughs> Communication's important. You know, we're falling out too. And we're just two sad guys in cloaks failing an escape room in stark silence. And we get around towards the end, there's a bit we need to hold hands to make a candle light up, that's really awkward. And then towards the end, there's a bit where you need to make a potion in a cauldron, right? And just add stuff to it. And there's like a little bit that you need to decode first that tells you the instructions and everything. And there's fun little extra bits. So for example, the first one is, it's like five drops of squib residue whilst hopping. And normally it's like a family and it's like, oh, mum's hopping, what a laugh. <laughs> you never see mum's hop, do you? What a great day we're having. Five stars on TripAdvisor. <laughs> when it's just a guy <laughs> on his own, within the hour, heartbroken, solemnly in silence, like, <laughs> just staring you out. <laughs> Takes on a very different tone. Second thing is you need to add some kind of stone to the mixture, and that you need to do that whilst humming your favorite tune, Mumford and Sons, no wonder she left. <laughs> Third one is an owl feather, right? And he needs to add an owl feather to it. And he's decoding the little extra bit of fun, right? And he's looking away from me. And he's decoding it. I know what's coming, because let me remind you, I work there. <laughs> and he's decoding it, and I know when he's finished, because the extra bit of fun with this one is it must be used to tickle. <laughs> I'm not even on a living wage, by the way, just as a by the by. <laughs> he's decoding it, and I know he's got to the end, because he gets to the end, and he just goes, <sighs> And he turns around, it's a bit like a Mexican standoff from a Western. <laughs> and he's looking at me and I'm just like... <laughs> okay, we're here now, you know? <laughs> and for a penny, and he tickles me and I burst out laughing, you know, because <laughs> it's ridiculous. And then he starts laughing. Suddenly, last 20 minutes, me and Sean have a fucking class time in this escape room. <laughs> Running around solving puzzles. I feel like one of his mates rallying around him. You know when your mate gets dumped, you don't need the real story, you just take their full version of events. I'm like, fuck Stacey, she can never solve these puzzles. <laughs> You know, <laughs> we get out, we don't, uh, we don't break the record, I could've. <laughs> Take a team photo, usually, I'm in it, there we go. I send him back through, and he goes back through to the bar, and who's sitting there, look what the cat dragged in, Stacy's here, this ought to be good. <laughs> he goes back and he speaks to Stacy, and I'd love to lie to you for theatrical reasons and pretend I overheard this amazing conversation that changed my perspective, but the truth is I never heard it. But they're like kissing and cuddling, making up, so, suddenly I'm just on the sidelines watching on like some scorned mistress. 
like it meant nothing. <laughs> they all leave you in the end, so that's the moral of that story. <laughs> I think there is a moral in that, right? You know, that's life, innit? You get thrust into some weird, shitty situation. If you resist it at first, you have a bad time. But if you give over to it and you choose to have a laugh, you'll have a good time, right? That's what my grand was all about. That's what she taught me. Brings me no pleasure to tell you, but my grand died during, uh, you know, when I was writing this show. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm not wheeling her out for, like, a narrative conclusion or something like that. She's an old lady. It's what happens in life. But I'm going to tell you one thing about her funeral, right? Because her funeral was a laugh. Basically, at the funeral, my dad didn't want to speak at the funeral, which is fair enough. So he, he gave notes for the minister to read out, uh, which is, I'm honestly considering for my next show. Because <laughs> some poor vicar up here going, pull my back moustache. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad, he's made notes for the minister and the minister's doing this reading and it's very touching. You know, he's talking about my grand's life and it was, it's very emotional. He, you know, he's like, she, she was 94, Betty, when she died. She had a long and happy life, good innings. She's from a different era. Uh, she left school at 13, Betty. She went to work at Tenants Brewery, where she worked all her days as a secretary. She was the youngest there by, by some margin. She was 13 when she left school, as I say, and she had these strong, older friends, these female role models, twice, three times her age, and they took her under a wing, and that's beautiful. And I, I thought it was beautiful, and I thought it was very emotional. But listen to the swing this minister takes next, right? <laughs> I didn't see this coming, right? So he's like, Betty, she was 13 when she left school, and she had these friends twice, three times her age, and he names them, because, you know, Morag, Moira, Joyce, Listen to this, he goes, are any of them here today? <laughs> she was 94. <laughs> they were twice, three times her age. Of, co of course the girls are here, the girls wouldn't miss this. <laughs> they came in the party bus, I mean, fuck me. My last birthday was a bit of a washout because Love Island was on. This prick minister is having to go at my grand for not pulling a crowd. Just... <laughs> Just her mates are a bunch of literal Victorian ghosts. I mean... <laughs> what chance she got? I'm not even sure he was a minister. I think he might have just had ten cans and believed in himself. <laughs> so, a couple of loose threads to tie up very quickly before I go, I suppose. Um... The rest of the stag was fun. I spoke about that for a while. Uh, <laughs> other things became more important. Chris and Pippa got married. That was nice. England lost in the final. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Wicks is still at large. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted to do the show in 2020, and it was going to be called No Worries If Not, and it was going to be about how everything was going really great. And now I'm standing here in 2023 in front of you, and it's about how everything's gone to complete shit. <laughs> but... Don't worry about me, it's all good. I'm just as happy now as I was then. It's all good. Like, that's what life's about, isn't it? You get, shit happens and you move past it. I was, you know, down after a lot of this stuff had happened and I wanted to speak to someone, need to talk to someone. And I wanted to speak to my grand, to be honest. That's one of the sad things when you lose someone, you can't just ring them up. So I was assessing my options, you know, and what I'm trying to tell you is you either die a hero or you live long enough to send your mate John a 15 minute voice note. <laughs> Not proud of it. I was distracting myself for a long time. You know, it's been a very difficult year, but eventually you need to come out into the world again, be vulnerable and put yourself out there. And, you know, you got to feel your feelings, right? You know, that's what my personal trainer told me. So I'm <laughs> going to leave you with three closing sentiments. And listen, they're cliches. You know, it's nothing you've never heard before. But they're cliches for a reason. They're the things you need to remind yourself. And the stuff I've needed to remind myself of this year. So, uh, you know, one, accept everything as it is and have a laugh. Two, be kind to yourself. Three, Appreciate the small things in life. As my gran would say, if you didn't laugh, you'd greet. If you didn't laugh, you'd cry. As Lizzo would say, <laughs> Woo, girl. <laughs> got to kick off your shoes. <laughs> Time to take a deep breath. Got to focus on you. <laughs> and as Donkey from Shrek would say, <laughs> I like that boulder. That is a nice boulder. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out. It's been so much fun. I've been streaming first, and you've been an amazing audience. I'll see you some other time. Take care. Thank you.